OK. Takže, dobré ráno. Rád by som vás privítal na prednáške Qualcomm SOC Upstreaming Adventures in 2020. Rád by som povedal, že prezentácia je zameraná aj na ľudí mimo Slovenska a Česka, tak je prezentácia pane v angličtine. Ďakujem za pochopenie. So, good morning. I would like to welcome you to our presentation called SOC Upstreaming Adventures in 2020. I would like to note that the presentation is also focused on people outside of Slovakia and Czechia. Thus, the presentation will be fully in English. Thank you for understanding. And so with that done, let's start. So, you may be wondering, who are those three guys on my screen? Well, we are the SO mainline team, a group of independent developers in love with embedded devices and ARM Linux. And now a little bit about myself. My name is Martin Botka, a computer science student studying in Slovakia, currently studying applied informatics. I spend my free time doing all sorts of things, ranging from development to gaming and server, which means that I maintain my local HP Prolian DL360EG8 server. And when I really do have some time to enjoy, I play a game or two. And now I will give the word to Angelo, who will introduce himself. Hello, my name is Angelo Joaquino Darvegna, but please call me Angelo. I am an old and grumpy Italian guy, No, I'm joking, not I'm being Italian. I'm 29 and I'm not grumpy. Uh, and well, I'm passionate about electronics and hardware and software engineering. Today, the world is based on technology. Ain't that beautiful? Please, Conrad, introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Conrad Dybcio, a 17 years old final year high school student in Poland. I like maps and IT, and that's about it. In our team, there's also Marine, who would only join us today as a spectator. With that, please continue. So, hello everyone. I'm presenting to you the So Mainline team. We are a group of independent developers who literally fell in love with embedded solutions and small form factor consumer devices on, but definitely not limited to, the ARM and ARC64 architectures, generally running on some sort of Linux-based operating system. Let's go for a short story about our team. We have started fiddling with consumer smartphones and tablets, equipped with various processors and system on chip, or SOC, from various vendors, and acknowledge that these small devices were slowly turning on to be small form factor fully fledged computers. This has turned on our wishes to see them fitting more and more of our always growing needs through time. Then every one of us at different times met Sony. We started contributing to Sony Open Devices, that is a project that brings you an up-to-date kernel and operating system based on the latest release of the, of the Falcon Board Support Package, from now on called BSP, which also includes a very often already updated customized Linux kernel in an open source form. From now on, we will refer to this as downstream or downstream kernel. So what we did there has led us to learn how many efforts are required to port newer kernels on older pieces of hardware. Each release would require a major porting of many of the drivers that are required to make a device, such as a smartphone, to work correctly due to many obstacles. First of all, Linux is constantly changing, for the better or the worse, with API updates and breakages. Then you have a sort of chip maker's API, which would break even more. And sometimes with the support for all the SOC basics that had to then be readapted to that. This made us to think about any ways to stop seeing our work almost completely wasted every year at every new cycle. And after a bit of head banging, despite some issues with this and that, more on that later, the final solution in our minds was than the only one, and the only one that made, really made sense. Upstream them. So, you may be asking, why are you doing this? And when we asked ourselves the same question, we came to a few answers. So, let's go over the small answers. You see, this is our hobby. So, we would not be doing this if we didn't like it, obviously. And we love running mainline or even next branches of Linux on our computers and servers. And when we have the ability to make it run on our phones, then we of course take the chance. Okay, those were just these small answers. There is one thing that plays a huge role in this. And that is, 
we are crazy. And yes, while this was mainly made for the jokes, it has some truth to it. But there are also some reasons that we just cannot explain in one sentence, and they just deserve more time. And so now Angela will tell you a bit more about relying on chip makers may not be always the best solution. Angelo, please, the stage is yours. So you will agree with me that whatever topic your project covers, being it in hardware engineering, software engineering, hobby cutting, building a shelf or cooking dinner, you'll have to make a plan. Or it would become really hard to keep track of what you're doing and to finally succeed. When you work on a small big project, even if you start doing things just because you need one more little piece in your puzzle, especially if you keep adding pieces, you will forcefully eventually stop and start evaluating all of the ways and the true possibilities that you have to succeed in what you're doing. And this is what we eventually also had to do because, well, when we started our coding work, we had to really bring it up piece by piece. So let's evaluate it again, in short, right here, right now. An e-consumer device is made by many people, like hardware and software engineers, quality assurance teams, design teams, and so on. This is what we call the vendor. Let's not forget that your consumer device is made of many parts, which your vendor has to source from various other entities. To make it shorter, we will ignore parts like displays, hardware buttons, and some others, and focus on the main one. The core of your consumer device is the system on chip. For example, your random Qualcomm Snapdragon, MediaTek Helio, Intel Atom, AMD Geared, and others. These very small chips are containing not just your CPU, but in modern and highly power efficient chips, you also have processors for specific applications such as digital signal processors for audio, video, and imaging, graphics processing unit, and others. These all need to be handled by the operating system that is running on your device. So finally, you need drivers. Please note that chip makers are pushing out a new generation of SOCs every year that will internally behave differently from the old one, and consequently, vendors are pushing out new products in order to be appealing on the market. In order to keep doing that, both vendors and chip makers will have to eventually stop supporting their older products because updating one means spending a lot of the developers' time to port drivers around new, custom again, code bases, and this would not be a sustainable business strategy. They have to either stop developing new hardware or stop developing new software for old hardware. They just cannot keep rebuilding the software for these legacy products from scratch. So they cannot afford to keep them always updated. But you may ask, why would we need to update a device that is working correctly? Why should we touch something that needs to be, seems to be already perfectly fitting our needs? There are many reasons for that. Let's start with the biggest concern that we have. Let's explore it with Conrad. Thank you. As Angela has just mentioned, Vendors and chip makers cannot keep supporting older products indefinitely for various reasons. When the device or platform becomes unsupported, it cannot be considered secure anymore. End of life equals end of security. A great example of this is Android with its monthly security patches. Every few weeks, Google will push a batch of fixes and improvements that will keep your device more secure. As long as your device is supported, you likely have nothing to worry about. Your vendor will likely fix major security issues within a week or two, more often than not, even before you'll get to know about their existence. But what happens when the time comes and, sadly, the support for your beloved device has to be ended? Well, it can no longer be considered safe. But don't panic. It's unlikely that a week after the vendor decides that the time has come, you'll instantly lose your money, passwords, etc. But you can no longer consider your device fully secure, and therefore it's statistically more likely to get infected or compromised. So what to do next? Well, if you're working with the BSP and or the downstream kernel, you're likely out of luck. 
you cannot just rebase your kernel on a newer Linux release and fix potential issues in pre-compiled drivers. Enter open source. Now imagine that when the dreaded two or three years period passes, your phone is as secure, if not more, than when you pulled it out of the box. It's still smooth, equipped with the latest optimizations and possibly even additional features. Still not convinced? Then consider that since the code is available, you can look for potential security issues, analyze it yourself, or reveal tools of choice. And not only security, you can introduce new features and change the visual appearance of a given program. Also, you can submit your changes to the main repository, also known as the AppStream, and let other people benefit from your work. Open source software also has great backing behind it. More and more companies like Google or Microsoft keep contributing to or sponsoring OSS projects on top of creating their and maintaining their own ones. This only shows it's the correct way forward. Even considering all of this, sadly, a good chunk of software and intellectual property, or IP for short, is closed source. While this is a great way for its creators to make sure nobody steals their precious code, sadly, this also brings some drawbacks that on Angela will tell you about. As said earlier, Vendors are starting the project on a software base that's provided by the chip maker called Load Support Package. In this session, we are talking about Qualcomm in particular, but this actually applies to a variety of chip makers. BSPs contain a number of software pieces distributed as a single package, targeted to one specific family of SOCs and one specific operating system and licensed over various terms from BSD to GPL, Apache, and custom proprietary licenses used to rightfully protect intellectual properties. We all agree that protecting your own intellectual property is something that you definitely need to do in order to keep up with competitors and avoid to get them to reuse your hard-earned work without consent. We are not complaining about this. We agree. Let's dev brings the industry to a point in which many software teams will realize the very same sub-project aim to really do the same thing, sometimes in mostly the same way, and not all the times, this time could be used to bring innovation to a piece of software that was already written by someone else, instead of reinventing the wheel many, many times. But someone may disagree on that for many good reasons, on which I would also agree. In literally everything that we do, there's a bright side, but there's also a dark side. There is no one to blame for this because, well, we are humans. Mankind is great in all of our shapes, and in my opinion, the greatest thing in us is that simply besides us being a piece of biological art that may be close to perfection, well, nobody is perfect. But ain't that beautiful? Yes, it is. This means that we are not machines. Every one of us thinks differently from the other, which is the very reason why, even on the same topic, we do many different great things. But we also make many different big mistakes. Translated to software developers, this means that during the development process, we are also unconsciously introducing bugs. Now it's true, bugs shall be solved in order to raise the quality of your software before releasing it to the public which is what quality assurance teams also try to help with, discovering them and delivering the results to the software team again. But again, QA teams are not perfect either. So sometimes various kind of, kinds of bugs are making their way into the final release, which becomes public. Bugs, it's tedious when you're trying to browse a web page and your browser just closes on you. It's even more tedious when you're trying to take a picture and something undistinguishable comes out of your camera, but it's too late. You've already lost the moment. It's way, way more tedious when you're receiving a phone call and your phone doesn't ring. So what can you do then? Your vendor may not be able to reproduce the same bug, or they may, but your product reaches its end of life and they won't fix it. You may buy a new product that may not exhibit the same bad behavior on you, but perhaps the new one wouldn't fit your size requirements, 
your comfort requirements, or perhaps for any other reason, you just want to keep the product that you bought because it's enough for you. But you also need that bug fixed. Let's say that casually, you're also a developer and you will also be able to solve that issue on your own. You'll be lucky if that faulty component is released under any license that implies providing the source code for it. But literally too many times the bugs are also coming out from cloud source components provided to you, the user, in binary form. Fix it, they said. It's a one-liner, they said, but still, you cannot see the code. You cannot modify it. You cannot recompile it. But what if you could? What if that component had source code for it? What if that component was also shared between a lot of SOCs? And what if that was in a very big project that uses it for many use cases on many, many devices and had that bug affecting a big user base? Random developers from around the world went to the fix sometimes even for free, just for them, but then share it to the world. That word includes your vendor, which would have to lose one quarter of the time that they would need to fix it on their own. That word includes you, which brings us to the real point here. Open source is good for everyone in a way or another. Open source means that you are in control. And speaking of control, what operating system is typically controlling the behavior of your favorite device? Let's check it out with Conrad. Thank you. You know what a Raspberry Pi is, right? Of course you do. But do you know your phone is just as, if not more, flexible than that small SBC? Let me tell you. On commercial devices, the product basically defines the operating system it's going to run. If it's a smartphone, then it most likely runs Android or iOS. And if it's a PC, then more often than not, it runs Windows. Sometimes though, you'd really like to change that, wouldn't you? Here's a few, here's a few examples on how different OSs can be useful and more proper for a given use case. Let's start with Arch Linux. Do you run it on your PC? And if so, do you love the AR? Well, what if I told you, you could benefit from the same community-driven software base on your phone? Cool, huh? Arch is on the bleeding edge, so you get updates really fast compared to other distributions. And if you prefer having your software always up to date, you would appreciate it on your phone. Next up is Gentoo. Do you like performance? Or maybe do you like having the complete control over the software on your device? Then you should take a look at Gentoo. It's great for high performance applications and every installation can be tailor-made for your specific needs. And why so? Well, because everything is built from source. But what are the benefits of that, you may ask? You see, compilers are pretty smart these days and if you tell them to, they will optimize the programs they build to perfectly suit your CPU and that can result in significant performance gains. So, continuing, each Gentoo install is unique, and you make it so. For example, you can make it ideal for your very specific OpenCL workload. Next one is Tizen. This one is not something that is adapted for a use case. It is built for a use case. While Android is a smartphone OS that's only adapted to work on bigger, think TVs, tablets, and smaller, like smartwatches, form factor devices, Tizen is purpose-made. So instead of cutting down a phone OS, you're creating one that's specifically intended to fulfill your needs. The entire OS's behavior may mutate completely in, dif in different use cases that you built it for, even though it supports the very same APIs across all of them. And for the best part, it's maintained and supported by the Linux Foundation. Do I have to go on? Another one is Debian. Do you love stability? Let me tell you, Debian is here to serve you. Yes, the very one you're likely running on your server. You can make your phone a PHP, SQL, WWW, or even entire LAMP stack server. It can also solve as a matrix or Mastodon instance. And your phone likely has a USB port. So make use of it. Plug in an external drive, 
or six if you're that kind of a person, and make a relatively cheap and affordable NAS. Maybe you want to have your own instance of, for example, Fabricator, Nextcloud, OwnCloud, or maybe set up a mirror for, your, for the Linux distro of your choice. Debian should be on your watch list. And finally, Fedora. Do you want to run the distro that Linus Torvalds himself runs? Well, Fedora also has an ARM port. Do you love GNOME? Fedora provides a pure GNOME shell experience. And it just so happens that, love it or hate it, GNOME 3 has been designed with touchscreens in mind. Most of the apps already scale well to a 5 or so in smartphone. And if they don't, Purism, the company behind Librem 5, has got you covered with their scale-to-fit script, which is, as the name suggests, will make the spurious app behave like it should. Fedora is maintained by Red Hat, the company behind, behind RHEL. That speaks for itself. It has great security and redundancy. But hey guys, Linux sucks. Or does it? Uh, really, it does. It's reverse engineering our brains, especially in downstream projects. Sometimes you have very, very convoluted drivers that are sometimes very difficult to understand. And this sometimes requires you to actually try to reverse engineer the brain of the developer that wrote the software that you try and read. Well, maybe I'm downstream, but that issue is not present in the context of mainline. Here, the drivers have to pass some initial quality assurance by maintainers and really anybody else who wants to contribute, because the more eyes look at it, the better. That said, you do not have to worry about reverse engineering your brain, or anybody else's brain for that matter, at all. Yes, but even on the mainline Linux kernel, Application programming interfaces, or APIs, are not really stable, which means that every time you port downstream drivers to new releases, you will have to do a lot, you will have a lot of work to do. Many times you will even have to rewrite the driver from scratch, but then this is not entirely a bad thing. As the Linux APIs are getting updated for the better and putting wrappers around old ones makes code readable and way less convoluted other than avoiding to literally destroy performance, so sometimes it is a necessary evil, but still evil. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that one. While APIs do change, they do so for the better rather than for the worse. They are expanded to support a broader range of hardware and a greater spectrum of features. But as I said already, all drivers for old kernel releases are very often unusable with newer kernels. Things are changing so rapidly that this starts happening as soon as every six months. You cannot waste weeks of your life to do the same thing over and over and over again every six months. This is unbearable. Well, this is kind of like putting a Ferrari engine in a 50-year-old Russian Lada you cannot expect it to just work. The times have changed and so have the interfaces. And then the APIs are the higher level core of your kernel. If they change, then this means that it's not perfect. Why should I base my project on something that has not reached a certain level of perfection? You should get your project going on something that is already perfectly working. Well, it surely is not perfect, as nothing on planet Earth really is, but you can make it more perfect than it is currently. Patches and general contributions are always welcome. Yes, but then if my code lands upstream and something happens, they expect me to be ready and fix it. But if I made that mistake, then maybe I wouldn't be able to fix it. If the driver remains unfixed, the code is thrown out again, so I will have to start my own fork of Linux and start a so-called downstream project. Well, Linux maintainers are not evil. They are, in reality, quite good people. They will always help you to get your software going and to elevate it to a good standard. Only then will it be accepted into the mainline kernel. 
It can sometimes take a bit of time, but it definitely is worth it. You don't have to worry about that. And so as we have just concluded, while just like everything, Linux has many of its own drawbacks, it's, it truly is a neat piece of software to work with. And with that in mind, let me talk a little bit about what things I faced when I initially was bringing up Xperia XA2 and Xperia 10 series smartphones on the mainline kernel. Ah, early porting. It's my favorite stage of bringing up a platform. This is where I learn about its most apparent quirks and other peculiarities. I like it so much, in fact, to be fair, that I had my initial tree up and ready even before the phone arrived at my doorstep. Yeah, seriously, I had an over 5,000 lines diff on top of mainline waiting for the device so that I can test it. But as you might imagine, the beginnings were not that simple. Now I'm, now I'm going to talk about some of the issues I faced at first. The initial booting went pretty well. Neither the bootloader nor AVB or any additional security measures prevented mainline Linux from booting. The reserved memory map had to be redone a couple of times, but that was my mistake. Since the bootloader on your Qualcomm devices is EDK2 based and Sony decided to enable the boot logo, and also that my display panel was a command mode one and auto refresh was enabled, which shouldn't be a, a requirement on video mode panels, I could make use of simple FB with basically no issues. That let me read the D message directly off of the phone's screen, which was a major convenience over trying to guess what's wrong. Sometimes though, it crashed promptly and my rescue was the high FPS mode in my other smartphone. I would record the screen and watch the footage frame by frame. And as hilarious as that may sound, it is a really neat way to retrieve logs from the device. Please note that this is not something you, you can count on with all devices. After making sure some fundamental features like all CPUs getting up worked correctly, I started experiencing some lockups. These turned out to be related to the SMMUs or system memory management units. After diving into it a little bit more, I discovered that the BSP kernel had some notable changes made to the ARM SMMU V2 driver. After adapting them to the upstream one, the issue has disappeared. When we started preparing for sending our code upstream, these workarounds got rewritten in a different way to align with the upstream code style. When I tried to retrieve the kernel log for a less, let's call it creative way, I turned to our old friend, Pistorm. I configured it to match the downstream node and try to get some output, but nope, no luck, zero response. Well, too bad. I think I once got some garbage output when I rebooted straight to Android, but that was when I didn't need it that much anyway. Most developers' favorite way of getting kernel locks is universal asynchronous receiver transmitter, UR, or more generally, a serial console. This is indeed a very convenient solution that requires little to no setup, as the bootloader usually leaves the necessary clocks and regulators set up, and comes with its own advantages, such as the possibility of seeing bootloader locks, so that you can know whether the booting process stopped there, or if Linux, or any other kernel for that matter, was properly bootstrapped. While it's great for many things, it's also not trivial to set up, more often than not, it requires disassembly of the device and soldering tiny, and I mean really tiny, sometimes as tiny as half a millimeter thick wires to equally small parts on the motherboard. That procedure is very error prone and not only does it void your warranty, as you have to physically open the device and apply a hardware modification, but it can also kill both your device if you still solder around, solder the wrong paths or do everything correctly but plug in the phone to a serial adapter with a different voltage range, but also you, if you mistakenly damage the battery in the process, which, while rather unlikely, is well possible. The GCC, or Global Clock Controller Driver, was already upstream, 
while it wasn't perfect and turned out to have some issues that we managed to fix later on, it was just fine for early booting purposes. Though clock control drivers for other subsystems, MMCC for multimedia subsystem related clocks, and GPUCC for the Adreno GPU clocks needed to be added. All of these are mandatory for managing the hardware clocks on off states, their frequencies, and making sure platform drivers can access them. US was a long story. I tried tackling it from different angles, and nothing seemed to really work. I first configured the Unboard Synopsis Designer Core USB controller, and then started by banging my head against the wall with configuring the file or the physical layer. I checked my configuration, I double checked, I triple checked, but it just didn't want to play along. I would always get this file log failed error. Then I started hacking on the driver and placing a lot, and I mean a lot, of debug prints to see where it actually failed. After spending a few good hours, I managed to find one offending line. Yeah, a single one. I added a if not SDM660 statement above it, and it worked perfectly. I could not only see the phone registering as a USB device on my PC, but I could also set access the device via SSH and Telnet. Then I tried to verify once again whether everything I got so far actually worked. So I started playing around with the device and noticed that the volume down key would cause a lot of D message spam and just wouldn't work. I tried a couple of things, including explicitly defining the PMIC GPIO, which means a pin controlled by the power management integrated circuit responsible for that key, which shouldn't be and isn't needed most of the time. Here I'd like to thank Łukasz Patron, also known as Luke1337, for figuring out the problem and testing it on his devices. It turned out there was an issue with the hierarchical GPIO setup introduced to the upstream kernel not very long ago. Our PMIC just didn't like that very much, and reverting that change made the key work. We're still working on figuring out what's wrong with that configuration, but it's only a minor inconvenience. The microSD slot is praised by all SBC lovers. It allows you to quickly switch OSs simply by swapping out the card for a different one, or even making a multi-boot one. I like that idea too, so I added the basic configuration, SDH style node in the device tree along with its pin configuration, and no luck. The SD card would only show up sometimes, and even if it did, I had no way of mounting it or otherwise interacting with it. We then tried the setup on next devices and we faced a pretty peculiar result. The microSD slot only worked on Xperia 10 and 10 Plus, but didn't work at all on the XA2 series. That only shows how similar hardware can be very different at times. Some drivers for Qualcomm devices are very similar ac across generations of system on chips. We surely did take advantage of that, and instead of reinventing the wheel, we added support for SDM660 family processors were applicable, including, but not limited to, audio digital signal proce processor, or ADSP, USB control and Pi, mobile display subsystem, including mobile display processor, along with the display serial interface, or DSi hardware. When I managed to get a reliable boot, I needed a way to interact with the device somehow. It's not like volume up, power button, and the camera shutter are enough to comfortably navigate around the UI. And I then discovered that the Nile platform, or XA2 series, was equipped with a well-supported upstream Synaptics RMI4 compliant touchscreen. I added the necessary nodes, configured them properly, compiled the kernel, booted the device, and faced an error. After digging around in other mainline device trees for Qualcomm devices, I found a genius approach. Instead of fighting with the hardware-backed I2C bus, I added a simple CPU-driven I2C GPIO node. While it was much slower and less responsive, with huge delays and other drawbacks, it worked. And that made me happy. After booting into a LLVM pipe render XFC for desktop, 
I managed to interact with the on-screen keyboard and a terminal emulator and get a full D message. Neat. Now I knew what else I had to fix. And so I did. Later on, I tried to fix the situation properly. I dug around once again and realized I didn't attach DMA or direct memory access to the I2C nodes and the SOC GPIOs weren't explicitly set to the I2C functions. Fixing both of these issues made the touchscreen come up on the hardware-driven bus, as it should. Compared to the old one, it was a miles better experience. One of the other issues is that the phones would heat up significantly, even more so than if they run their original software. Not only was it inconvenient, it was also a sign of the battery discharging quickly. Well, the first law of thermodynamics. This was solved rather quickly by the introduction of what's known as an interconnect driver in the upstream terms, but you probably know it as MSM bus from downstream. It is basically the network on chip hardware similar to Infinity Fabric on modern AMD CPUs that connects various IP blocks with the main application processor and other IP blocks. While at it, we also fixed up various clock drivers so as not to require the CLK ignore unused command line argument that would then disable the unused clocks. After writing the interconnect driver and setting it up properly, we were surprised by how big of a change it was. The phone was literally stone cold and the battery draw was nearly zero. I would sometimes flip it with a Linux image booted and then after rebooting into Android after a few hours, I noticed that only a single digit percentage of battery was consumed. While the bootloader was rather friendly all the way along, we were sometimes met with a big red triangle and an NA note, your device is corrupted and cannot boot. That's AVB, or Android Verified Boot, state red. The bootloader thought that our phones didn't have a boot image, or had an improper one. And while the immediate thought was to reflash it with the stock Android system that it came with out of the box, it turned out that a simple fastboot command, switching to the inactive AB slot and back to the previous one, made AVB happy. While it's important to have your security measures in place for use with the vendor-provided software, they can sometimes be a pain to work with when they're doing mainline work. Thankfully, this one wasn't very preventive and was easy to overcome. Let's now hear from Angelo. When you work on a very big project, your contributions, being them in terms of entire drivers, enhancements or bug fixes to existing ones, are getting seen by a lot of people. On Linux, that's usually the subsystem maintainer, the driver developer, in case you modify one, and other developers that have experienced that bug or that are interested in running your driver because they have the hardware for it. On downstream projects, you generally have a small team or one that's anyway surely smaller than a big community like the Linux one that has to take care of all the aspects of an entire device and platform, and everyone has to do basically everything. There are no people that are specialized on one specific piece. There's nobody who can nitpick that one small thing that then reveals to be a life changer on the long run. That's a big difference. Sure, your code takes a longer time to get merged in, even if it works fine for you, but at the end of the day, you end up with something solid something that won't break that easily, something that is compliant with rules that are not only for your code to be understandable by others, but very, very easily updated, sometimes even automatically, in case of an API change and a subsequent kernel update. This means that you don't waste weeks of your time to develop something that gets wasted at every cycle, or at least not that easily. Since then, it's basically always a matter of 60 seconds in case some update that has to be done by hand gets requested. New kernel releases also contain a new modular framework and new APIs meant for you to be able to write less code. And after all, that's the whole point of APIs for your driver to be smaller and more efficient, for another driver to be as small and as efficient as yours, but for a bug to be fixed on both in one shot. This, of course, also reduces code duplication by a lot. 
since developers don't have to reinvent the wheel every time to do basically the same action. Just great. But this doesn't mean that our stream never breaks. No, it does. And luckily, it doesn't happen frequently. There we have another huge difference with downstream projects that becomes even bigger in our case. There, you have to understand what's broken between the Linux kernel and a big amount of proprietary code for which there is no source code availability. Now, I challenge you to bisect a bunch of binaries and fix them. Or is that even possible? Well, upstream spirit is open source everything. So yes, there it's possible. Everything that runs on your system, well, unfortunately, apart from trusted firmware, has a source code that you can read. There you just take the last working version and bisect. You will probably find the fault in less than one hour and produce a fix. Not to mention that you may not be the only one affected by the breakage. So sometimes, before you even realize, even if you really want to be the one that makes the day, someone else may look at it before you do and fixes it for you in full open source community spirit. So great. And now I would say something about the road to upstream, the achievements and the obstacles. I think it is only fair if I start with what we have achieved. So as you can see, basically two entire platforms just work. But as you can imagine, this didn't come for free as nothing in life does. Let's start with the things that got us here. Let's start with the multimedia clock control driver. I work on this one with a little bit of help from Conrad. Let's say a few things about what it is, why it is needed, because I'm not gonna lie. I learned about it a few hours before I started working on it. So the multimedia clock control driver, as the name already suggests, is a driver that controls the multimedia clocks. But what does it really do? Well, I think it is better if I also explain what a clock is. And you may be thinking, well, it's a clock like I have on my wall, but that's only partially correct. Let's just say that the clocks in our smartphones are just signals that are generated by one or more chips that generate those at a very precise frequency. When I learned about this, the first thing that I asked was, why not just use quartz clusters? I mean, they are extremely precise in the frequency they generate. And while yes, that is true, they are also very expensive and it's very uncommon for a smartphone to have clocks generated by quartz crystals. While we do have some phones that have the clocks, parent clocks generated by quartz crystals. So yeah. And even if cost wasn't the breaker here, the chips we use in our smartphones to generate the frequency are not that bad compared to quartz crystals. But let's get back to the question. What does multimedia clock control driver really, really do? Well, let's just say that the display wants to output something. It gets a request to turn on at boot, and in that request, it also re gets the refresh rate to output it. So it says OK, and then requests from multimedia clock control driver to set the according clock to the frequency and turn it on. The multimedia clock control driver will just grab the request, look at the clocks, set the frequency according to the request, and turns them on or off according to the request. And that's basically it. So for the GPU rendering, we had to upstream the support for GPU clock control driver. And while 90% of the work, not counting the GPU clock control driver was done, the remaining 10% still took some time, but more about that later. Now a little bit about Bluetooth and Bluetooth audio. I was the one working on this. And I guess it's only fair if I tell you a story of how it went. As any other feature, I started by researching what is actually needed to make this work. From the kernel documentation, it could looked quite simple. Find out which UART it is, add Bluetooth node to it, add regulators, and off we go. Well, let's just say this was naive of me to think like that. Cause as we all know, nothing goes according to plan in development. So on the first day, I made a DTS and assigned it to UART. The issue was that I didn't know which UART path 
or Node it was, but thankfully there are only two which are actually usable without freezing the phone. So it's 50-50. I added the regulators that I looked up in downstream. Again, how naive of me to try to cut the time I had to spend on it. Let's just say this wasn't the greatest idea again. Now we finally get to the point of booting the device. And not surprisingly, it didn't work. The turnaround command for the Bluetooth chip was timing out. As you can imagine, that doesn't sound great. That's because it isn't. So the first thing that comes to my mind is that UR node is wrong. You see, we have four UR nodes on this platform, but only two work correctly and don't just freeze the entire phone. No, you may be wondering, why does Bluetooth even require a UR node to work? And that is an excellent question. You see, this is how the Bluetooth chip on our devices communicates with the rest of the phone. It's via UART. A few years ago, I thought UART was just used to get stuff into or out of some device too. That isn't the case. UART is so flexible that it can be used for anything basically. If you don't mind it being slow or adding more traces on PCB or wires to help with that. You see, in the basic configuration, UART is just four wires, but commonly only three wires or traces on PCB are needed. Those four wires or traces are VDD, RX, DAX, GND. VDD for power, and this is the wire that's not commonly used when you want to get the data out or into your device. Then we have RX. This pin is used for retrieving the data from the second device. This is usually not needed when you just want to get output out of your device during the early stages of mainline porting. But then we have TX. This pin is used for transmit data to the second device. And then we have GND. GND is just a shortcut for ground, as you may know. And if you don't use the pin, the electric current cannot flow through the cables or traces, and thus you will not get any data into or out of your device. But as I mentioned, the UART is very flexible. Do you need to mo get more data through it? Just add more pins. Don't need to send data to the device? Well, don't use the RX pin on the device. There is also RTS-CTS, or better known as flow control. Flow control basically controls the flow of data and controls it so as to not overwhelm a hot, slow receiver. So, now that we know what UART can be used for, basically anything, I changed the UART node in DTS. I flashed it, booted it up, and while it didn't solve the issue, at least it got rid of one error message. But the command timeout still remained. But now we at least know the UART, correct UART node. On the other day, things were going better, but still not great. I spent a lot of time looking at the downstream version and as to what it does. I found out that the regulators were not assigned correctly, or better say, wrong regulators were assigned to something they should have not been. One example of this, of this is Bob Regulator. Also, hi Bob. You see, Bob is a cool regulator. <laughs> In downstream version, they were using the Bob pin one regulator, but on upstream we are just using Bob. And this wasn't the issue. You see, when you have different drivers, they can name the, the regulator's names differently. This is just what happened. And I thought that we have to use the same regulators as on downstream. This is incorrect. So I started banging my head on the wall a few times and trying to figure out why it doesn't work. I went ahead and looked at downstream code for Bluetooth properly and in full detail now. And oh, will you look at that? The Bob pin is not the one that we are supposed to use. After acquiring this excellent info, I jumped into DTS, changed it, compiled it, and booted it up. Only to get the same exact message once again. I was confused, banged my head against the wall and table again multiple times. But first thing that came to my mind is that Bluetooth chip isn't getting the signal to turn on. And I will be partially correct. But now, why isn't the chip getting power? I mean, I could grab the hot gun, open the device and probe the chip, but that would be ridiculous. Each of those contacts is smaller than one millimeter. And if I ever so slightly just slip and shorten the pins, it can mean the death of the chip or even the device. And as you can imagine, this is not fun. So how do I find out what could possibly be happening? Well, when you cannot poke in hardware to see what's happening, then you look in software. 
So I use grep to see which file is printing the message. And I cannot state enough how many times grep saved me so much time or just made looking easier. If you are not using grep to find text inside a huge folder, then you should start. It's really amazing. Okay, but this is interesting. It looks like it tries to ask the chip for its version. And when it gets no response, then it just prints the message. Huh, could it be just wrong request? Well, that would make a little bit of sense, but the chip should at least respond with something like, hey, I don't know this command, but it doesn't. Okay, let's think about this. If I'm getting no response from the chip, that would mean that either I can communicate with the chip or it's not turned on. Since the chip is being turned on by a command, thus it must have the enough power to receive that command and send a response. So that leaves the chip isn't turned on basically in dust. So now we know that we, we cannot communicate with the chip. But why? Is the UR wrong? No, on the other one, we, have very, we get even more mess. But I left it like that for the day. I woke up the next day and after classes, I get back into it. And let's just say that with this day, I entered the state where everything I tried would not work. Multiple people looked at the Bluetooth downstream stuff, confirmed the regulators are correct, the UR is correct. So what is going on? It went on for weeks. And then one of, and then on one of our debugging sessions, Angela pointed out that the few pins are misconfigured. I thought about them, but I assumed they are were correct. How naive of me not to check again. As Angela said before, we are all humans and we are all different and we can make mistakes even if we don't know about it. So Angelo swiftly created a patch to configure the pins correctly. In all the excitement, I grabbed the patch, compiled the kernel and flash and boot. But I get the same error message. This is getting weird. I am not proud of the mistake I found. While I did download the patch, I forgot I didn't apply the patch yet. So I fixed that, flash and still the same issue. Okay, now I'm really confused. But it turns out I flashed the old kernel image. Oopsie. I rechecked everything, everything was fine, boot, and it works. Well, GNOME can detect the Bluetooth device, but that's just a config issue. Bluetooth CTO works with it just fine. And even Android can use it with the correct hole. And that wraps up our story time with Martin. Let's continue on camera. You see, Camera. This is something Angelo did basically in around one and a half weeks, approximately. He implemented the support for this platform in the IMX219 driver in upstream, which is also used by the Raspberry Pi camera module. And he wrote the driver for Xmore Ares mobile IMX300, which is the first fully stack high resolution CMOS image sensor for mobile. And to not forget one of our biggest achievements, there are no proprietary binaries around. While this is pretty clear to most of you, let's get over what exactly that means. As was already said, every OEM gets board support package from the SOC maker. Those board support packages also contain the source sources for the proprietary binaries needed for some functions of the phone. Those binaries then get saved on a partition on the phone, which then gets used by the open source components in various ways to make everything work. But hey, Martin, what about GPU or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth firmware? I mean, you can't just make it work without it. And yes, that is true. We cannot just ignore the firmwares. Those are just required to make everything to whatever they are firmware to make it work. Take it like this. Even the AMD GPU driver in the Linux kernel is fully open source but the GPU requires the firmware to get loaded for it to work. Without it, you get no GPU. The same happens here. Without the firmware, you just can't have the features. And while we have achieved a lot, as you can see, it didn't come for free and neither did it come in five minutes. And one of the biggest obstacles is that many hardware blocks and components are not documented. And even if they are, they are rarely accessible to the public. As you can imagine, this is not great and one does not allow us to check basically anything about the phone. Everything has to be grabbed from downstream or reverse engineered. And I will give the word to Angelo, who will say a little bit about the process of reverse engineering. 
So everyone has heard about reverse engineering at least once in their life, but some people associate it to something bad. Well, let's first have an overview of its meaning. Reverse engineering means understanding how something works, which is a thing that shouldn't be negated to anyone. We are free. Now, if you have carefully followed me in the previous talk, you surely recall me saying that every one of us is different. Each one of us also has different hobbies, and this also applies to reverse engineering. Okay, that may look crazy, but look, you have surely done some reverse engineering in your life already. Did you know that? Like, have you ever bought anything from one of these famous stores that are giving you furniture that you have to assemble on your own? Why are the instructions always clear and in your language? Let's go for a short story about an adventure of mine. Around five years ago, I bought a chest of drawers, and by the way, they were really heavy. Well, when we finally reached our apartment, we were happy to unpack it and start mounting the entire thing. In the middle of it, we acknowledged that two pages of the instructions were for a previous version of the furniture and wasn't applying at all to what we bought. Well, what, what would you do? Call them, wait for the instructions to come and do it next week? Well, I didn't have time for that. You know, we needed the new toy on that day. So what do you do in these cases? Think about how they designed it to be. There, you're reverse engineering the product that you bought, and uh, now you're trying to understand how they did it so that you can keep going with the assembly. Does it sound so bad? Now, the thing is, if they gave us the instructions in this specific field called data sheets, we will just follow them and implement the support with instructions about how the hardware works in our hands, but that doesn't happen so easily. Sometimes it's just enough to make a formal request. Well, not many times, but it's not always preventively a big no. But our experience was, of course, a big no. So again, what do you do in these cases? Now, you see, like my furniture assembly adventure, the same happened during our upstreaming journey, except replacing furniture with a phone and assembly of it with actions or, well, code to execute. This may be, of course, not a 10 minutes job. Complexity of the binary sometimes is very, very high, so you end up spending months sometimes trying to understand just what they do. But hey, hold on a minute. You may think, but you said that binaries are given to protect intellectual property. You even agreed. Yes, that's true. But I mean, it's not about copying the entire thing and throwing a bunch of lines of code, replicating it one on one. You are understanding how the basics of how things are working and then inventing your own reliable, clean and flexible way to make it work. That's really different. Okay, thank you, Angelo. And another obstacle, which is playing the angel and devil sides at the same time, is the code tininess requirements in the upstream kernel. Why devil and angel? Well, when you are writing drivers or just fixing something in upstream, you have to fix it, but you want the fix as soon as possible. So the users counting on the fix can get it as soon as possible. So you don't get woken up at 3 a.m. by a PM in a group chat of some custom ROM asking, you when that one fix will come. So you don't really care about if the code is looking good or not. And of course, an absolutely terrible code won't be accepted. But code quality is not priority there. It's if it works or not. And while upstream, you want fixes for some bugs or just added features, they have to be done ASAP too. You cannot just send a mail with the patch you have on downstream and accept it to be merged I mean, if it's great quality and nearly perfect, then yeah, maybe. But most likely what will happen is that the maintainer will tell you to change that or that, add something there, delete that part, and you get the point. You can't simply accept it to be merged instantly. Thus, we say they require a high quality standards. So you have some 
you have to spend some time fixing the code according to the changes the maintainers requested. This is why it's not sometimes great. But on the other side, once you get it accepted and it's cleaned up, you get rock solid code that will hardly break and the maintainability of it will be easy. So when API changes come and you will have to do it, it won't be as hard as it would be on downstream. And a good example of this is the touch screen driver. So if we take a look at the left side where we have the mainline touch screen driver and compare it to the left side, which is downstream driver, I mean, there is just no point even explaining the code style. It's kind of obvious, but let's explain it either way. The mainline version is independent, indented in the code style that mainline kernel uses. While everyone has their own preference, I think we can all agree that it is easily readable. When we take a look at the downstream version, we see code obviously, but what's catching my eye is the amount of if devs. But with the new code style, the code must be bigger, right? You see, that's not true. The upstream version is actually 9.6 times smaller. That's nearly 10 times. But okay, Martin, it's smaller, but I mean, you must have deleted some features from it to make it that small, right? Not really. Both downstream and upstream versions are functional and do basically the same thing. And now Angelo will tell us a bit more about camera. Aha, camera, you say? I see. That's what my phone would the site if it would be able to after me putting my hands on this topic. Nowadays, smartphones are also pocket cameras. As mobile imaging sensors are becoming better and better, being able to capture more light in dark scenes and or having a very high pixel count, usually great for well illuminated scenes. But there's more. To overcome to the usual loss of quality limitation on digital zoom, compared to dedicated digital camera devices. Now, some mobile camera models also have a limited lens movement to produce some extent of optical zoom. All of this in a very small space because, you know, that's just a phone. And I wouldn't be pleased if it wouldn't fit in my pocket. Of course, you cannot compare a smartphone, even the ones that have a big camera array, to a professional DSLR. But since around 2015, I don't miss my old dedicated, usually cheap pocket camera, as I'm totally happy to use my phone as a replacement for that. Also, the world has rightfully raised technology, and it's part of our everyday life. This means that nowadays it's very common to see people using their phone, tablet, or PC to do various tasks. This, of course, includes taking pictures to perhaps share on social networks, making vlogs, video calls, video conferences, and so on. Without going too far with premises, you see, it looks like having at least one camera in your computing device has become essential, other than a very common peripheral. For this reason, I just couldn't stop at a basic, hey, it boots, golden, ship it. Uh, that's not reaching the one to usability point. I had to go on. So there is a big difference between the camera implementation on the so-called downstream software base and the upstream one. Well, sorry for the size, but it was really a lot of stuff. In any case, if you really can't see it, you'll have to trust me on the word at this moment or do a five minutes research on your, on your own. Anyway, as you can or cannot see, here we have two examples. On the right, there is a big list of files that are pre-compiled libraries of a downstream camera implementation. They just come as you see them there. Of course, there is no code, nothing to really see there. On the left, there is a big list of commands. Yes, commands. Uh, this is a local version of the IMAX T19 driver. And by the way, stay tuned, this is getting sent upstream very soon, which in this screenshot contains some structure arrays that are used in the driver to set up various parameters on that specific image sensor. 
the improvement in this specific case is a clear documentation of the parameters that we set, with most of them being reused and concatenated when a specific condition is being asked by the user on the video for Linux 2 or V4L2 API. Being this driver engineered on the V4L2 API, it means that you can run it on your Raspberry Pi that is Broadcom based on your Qualcomm based device or eventually MediaTek, Intel, AMD, whatever you want, since the camera is connected to your system or SOC specific camera subsystem, which is also abstracted to the same V4L2. No need for yet another driver with yet another implementation, sending basically the same commands to your image sensor in yet another way. This, of course, means less efforts to bring up your sensor if a driver for it already exists. Perhaps you have to implement your SOC's camera subsystem driver if not already there, but you lose time to do one thing and only once, not twice. Downstream, Unless you are a OEM and you have a contract with the chip maker of your choice, well, you cannot do anything. Unless you use a reference implementation on a reference board with reference precompiled files. Change one voltage supply and you need new drivers. Then let's suppose that you have your camera sensor on your MediaTek board and you have a driver for it on DRAM downstream. Now, you want to do the same on a Qualcomm-based board. <laughs> Enjoy writing the entire thing on their code base. Of course, if you have no contract, which, by the way, costs a lot of money, because you're a hobbyist or anything else, you're not allowed to get the code. So, of course, hobbyists don't usually create their own phones even though I know people who actually sort of do. Uh, but one of you may want to re replace a camera model with another one that is luckily size compatible with whatever space you have there. And you can't. Now, since I don't have thousands of dollars to spend on such a contract every year, nor the time to redo everything every year, I'd like to use open source things. I think you agree. So getting to our specific bring up, how did I do that? Okay, first thing is know what you're dealing with. Once you know that, you're already halfway through, sometimes even more than just halfway. Please pardon me if I may overlook something in the following explanation, but I'm trying to make it less technical and as easy as possible so that everyone should be able to understand what's going on. So what we have to care about in our Qualcomm Platform's commerce subsystem right now is the Camera Serial Interface Physical Layer, or CSIC, which interprets signals coming on the physical lines, uh, lanes, <laughs> sorry, or the physical connections between your image sensor, which is the sender, and your SOC's camera subsystem. This is necessary because your image sensor doesn't necessarily set the data in the same order or in the same time as another sensor. It's anyway the base for interpreting a, a signal as a stream of data. Then we have the MIPI camera serial interface or CSI, which is used to receive data from your image sensor, and the camera serial interface decoder, which takes the received data stream and decodes it as per what the MIPI standard dictates into a media format like RGGB, UYVY with A10, 12 bits, or whatever else. And last but not least, the video front end model, or VFE which is used to either send a direct dump of the Im image that has been received from the serial interface, effectively bypassing any additional processing, or to process it by scaling, cropping, or converting the incoming data from the sensor's native bio format to something more compressed, and usually basically lossless that's commonly used as a video format like NV12, NV21, NV16, NV61, and others, which lowers the bandwidth requirements by a whole lot. In all this, 
thanks to other developers that have created a very flexible implementation for the Falcon Camera subsystem in the upstream kernel, I've had to implement support for the SDM 630 and, and SDM 660 specifics, which compared to the size of the entire implementation are very small. Then after a bit of this and that, and after a bit of head scratching, the camera subsystem worked. So at that point I was like, um, what do I do now? I have IMX something, what was it again? And big luck for me. Two of my devices are kit with a IMX 219 camera sensor on the front. That's the same camera sensor that has been used in the Raspberry Pi, and surprise, there's a driver for it. And surprise, it just works. Of course, to make it work perfectly well and produce great images, there was some hard adaptation to do, which takes ages to do because, well, no, that's not true. It was just one line of code. Upstream is just amazing but it doesn't end here. On this phone, there also is a big image sensor on the back, camera module assembly, the Exmo RS IMX300, which sports 23 megapixels and has no driver. My heart was literally screaming to do it. How could I not listen to my heart? Of course I did it. That one was a bit complicated, but eventually it worked and yes, this entire thing has already been sent upstream. The camera subsystem adaptation was accepted while the IMX 300 driver had some minor nitpicks to solve. And I'm confident on the fact that it will be accepted in the next version that I will send or in another one, but it's getting in, definitely. On the user space side then, apart many ways of pulling an image, uh, image from the camera on the command line interface, I didn't know what to do until an app called Megapixels came into play on Postmarket OS. And by the way, that's available on Arc Linux and some other distributions as well, which brings us a good-ish interface to get a preview from your camera and shoot pictures. Nice. Speaking of drivers, not everything is controlled by the Linux kernel by itself. There are also things that need interactions with the user space that runs on it. In this topic, I feel like I definitely have to give a note of merit to the Mesa 3D library. You see, when you run proprietary binaries, they're mostly targeted to your predefined GPU models and compiled against a user space of choice. Beware not your choice. Sometimes these binaries are made in-house and most of the times your chip maker and or your vendor are caring only about their specific application or use case. You will find this true in basically almost all of the situations. Now, do you remember the good old days that were definitely not good in that sense, when basically your only choice to get some performance or even just 3D from your graphics card on your PC was to install that binary release from your graphics card vendor. I definitely remember updating my disk at some point and got a completely broken X11 because, well, these drivers were not compiled against the newest version of the display driver, causing complete havoc and getting you to downgrade, downgrade things. Just goes. Today, things are different. Hola. Yes, there is some chip maker out there that wants you to rely on often broken proprietary drivers for your GPU, but there is another one who has actually understood that open sourcing their stuff gives them many advantages. They don't have to spend huge amounts of money to refactor their, their downstream driver every now and then. They don't even get bugs fixed and performance enhancements for their products. And sometimes this happens because of community efforts. Sure, they still have to ensure good quality, but you will agree with me that open source still gave them a pretty big advantage. Now, 
that someone uh, went very popular among Linux users. And the reason for that is simple. You just don't get some of the issues that are, well, unnecessary. Then there's another big point. These vendors are pushing on proprietary drivers only. Did they ever release an Android GPU driver? I don't think I've ever seen one. Speaking of which, have you ever seen a Libc driver for, for highly power efficient mobile GPUs? The ones that are integrated in your ARM or ARC64 SOC? I have, it's not fun. Also, it's again for one Linux kernel release on some Yakto project, and that big code base had to be frozen with JIT tags because otherwise it would break and... Oh, come on, it's killing me. Let's shine some light on this disaster. Hello, Mesa. The Mesa 3D library is a big project that started around 25 years ago that abstracts 3D hardware in user space by providing support for OpenGL, OpenGL ES, OpenDG, Vulkan, OpenCL, and a number of other specifications. And it's fully open source. This library is a reference implementation and contains base APIs for the aforementioned industry standards and other specific APIs on which all of the hardware specific drivers and software backends inside of it are based on. This code base can be compiled to work on many operating systems, and that's not limited to Linux-based ones with glibc, MUSL, or Bionic. In fact, you can also compile it on VSD and even on Microsoft Windows, for example. There it has been used many times to provide a software renderer to run OpenGL applications over new versions of the OS. But this is just one of the many examples on the flexibility of this project. So on the Mesa stack, apart software rendering, you can find open source implementations for real hardware, so real GPUs, from the oldest to the newest. If you're a Radeon owner, you surely, about, you surely know about AMD GPU. If you're an Intel owner, you know about the i9-15 and Iris, but it doesn't end here. Inside of Mesa, thanks to the community who sometimes reverse engineered proprietary drivers, you can also find support for mobile GPUs, such as the Vente GC series, Tegra, Armali, and others. And then, how can I ever forget that Mesa also supports the Qualcomm Adreno GPUs on the free Adreno driver? Now, that opens a whole new world for us. You remember that discussion about downstream and upstream kernels? It turns out that upstream, the driver for Adreno GPUs, hardly shares any similarity with the downstream one. And also, differently from the latest version of the downstream driver, which anyway provides performance enhancements and bug fixes, Fedreno doesn't only have support for the latest hardware, but for all. There we come. In our upstreaming adventure, we currently have sent a lot of kernel patches to bring up the SDM 630 and 660 series of SOCs. But wait, there's more. In order to do this, we also had to put our hands on the free Drano driver. Managing a GPU is not just a matter of sending a bunch of data to process. That process is a bit more complicated than that. Without boring you too much into details, Let's explain it in a way that is as easy as possible. Every GPU has its own architecture and its own way of understanding data. You effectively send a sort of program that it then has to execute. That program, like sort of like an application that you execute on your machine's, machine's CPU, has to be compiled. So it has to be transformed into instructions that your GPU understands. So you have to send a so-called compiled shading language program. This means that the driver for your GPU, which in this case is in the user space, so in the Mesa library, has to know how to do that. So has to know how to transform, for example, OpenGL calls into a shader. But many of you may already know that. 
And many of you may already know that luckily, Mesa also uses a sort of generic shader compiler, currently LLVM or ACO, which with some help from the specific GPU driver giving it some instructions about particulars of your hardware, is able to just build one that's ready to get sent without you having to write your own GPU specific compiler. So there are also other things to consider when dealing with at least some GPUs. Shaders are not the only thing that matters. You also have to deal with how your GPUs must be set in order for it to be ready for, to accept your shaders, or which of the so-called software quirks you need to, in order to address a faulty hardware behavior, which by the way is very, very common. But that's not over. It's mobile GPUs that we're talking about. They have to be very power efficient. So everything gets complicated by an aggressive power management that is sometimes built into microcode or firmware that your GPU runs and that you have to also manage in your driver. Messy. Yeah, it's a bit messy perhaps, but with a bit of magic after weeks or even months of research, everything is doable. After all, you can start seeing some results with just one line of code, thanks to how the free render driver is engineered. In any case, we just couldn't stop there because of course we wanted something usable. So there we go. Every one of us started doing research and despite currently having some performance issues, hey, it works. And without some GPU self art. So, after all this hard work, now nothing stops us from running GPU accelerated compositors on X11 or Wayland on our phones. This obviously opens possibilities such as running Matter, Sway, Light DM, or whatever other compositor and window managers or windowing systems that we want, as long as it uses any standard like OpenGL, OpenGL ES, or others that are supported by Guess what? Mesa. Of course, since Mesa provides GLES, that also means that we can run Android as well. And now we're free from proprietary drivers once again. Ain't that neat? After showing so many advantages of the mainline kernel, I'm pretty sure we made at least one person think, huh? I love this, but how do I even start? So here I am to answer. And first of all, hold on. As you likely very well know already, the GPL2 license that Linux is under states explicitly that the software comes with absolutely no warranty. This also applies here. Everything you do may or may not work and might or might not severely damage your hardware. The only person responsible for fried display panels, ICs overheated to death, exploded batteries, and white flash storage is you if you choose to proceed. By doing so, you accept the possibility of your shiny thousand dollars worth device becoming a shiny less than thousand dollars worth paperweight. With that out of the way, let's go further. Firstly, you should find and obtain a copy of the vendor provided downstream or BSP kernel. It contains all the changes that were required to make your hardware functional. The source code is likely to be found on the vendor's site or, the, or their GitHub profile. The screenshot that you see shows Sony Developer World website where they provide such releases. Before you jump into code, you should really get acquainted with your hardware. Try to find your SOC model number, display panel model, touchscreen IC name, power management integrated circuit, and really everything else you can find. It is really important. I cannot stress this enough. Using wrong drivers or otherwise setting up your hardware in a wrong way may imply permanent damage. We definitely don't want that. The easiest way to check what hardware is actually used on your device is to look around in the device tree. This basically is a way of describing hardware that lets Linux or other kernels slash operating systems 
know about some details of your boards, like hardware registers, compatible strings to match correct drivers, and first de per device properties. For example, voltage ranges on a regulator or clocks responsible for a hardware block. After you more or less know what to expect in terms of your hardware, it's finally time to download the mainline Linux source code. Choose the latest stable, for example, Refine 5.9, or the latest Next version, which is released almost daily and contains newest fixes and features, but is not expected to be stable. It's also a good idea to have a cross-compiler set up by now. After making a list of all hardware you could find, check for existing drivers in the mainline kernel. You would be surprised by how many strange and seemingly random ICs and other pieces of electronics you would have never expected to be touched by anybody else are actually supported and used in the mainline kernel. Be sure to check drivers for similar sounding chip names. They are often software compatible or at least require only minimal changes. Sometimes the same driver is utilized across many generations of products. Now go to Arch, ARM64, Boot, DTS, Qcom, Qcom directory, and create, create a device tree, a DTSI, so a device tree that is included in other device trees. For your SOC, feel free to copy another one from that directory and adjust values such as registers to the ones present in the downstream DT for your SOC. You'll very likely feel overwhelmed at first, but it's easy to get the hang of it. To get a minimal booting setup, you're going to need at least one described CPU core, a memory node, an interrupt controller, which is likely ARM GIC or global interrupt controller, an architecture timer, most likely an ARM V8 timer, and while not necessary, you likely want to set up a frame buffer console or a serial console of some sort. Then, create a DTS for your specific device. Make sure to include the SOC device tree and add MSM ID, PMIC ID, and VORD ID from the downstream one. This is a Qualcomm-specific way of making sure the device's bootloader only accepts images meant for your specific device, so as to prevent accidental damage caused by mismatch firmware. After you're confident everything went well and managed to compile the kernel without errors, Get a fire extinguisher ready, no, I'm just joking, and fast boot, boot your freshly cooked kernel. If the configuration was correct, you should see some output in your frame buffer or serial console, if you chose to use them, of course. Otherwise, the device will likely stay on the boot logo or plain black screen. And now comes the part when it's very difficult to explain things in a general way. You have to start adding support to your, for your SOC's IPUs in different drivers. Think MDSS for display, Fridgeno for GPU, etc. Among writing your own ones, such as the clock controller drivers. You'll likely spot similarities between all Qualcomm drivers, and you probably can guide yourself based on what you can find in drivers of already supported SOCs that were released in a similar time frame to your one. It's not like chip makers develop every chip from the ground up, and we have reasons to thank them for that. Generally, if something seems similar and doesn't seem unreasonable, such as 4K 120 FPS video encoding in a SOC used in $99 smartphones from 2014, you can probably copy paste it and see whether it works for you. Should you face any issues, ask around in the community. A great one to visit is Postmarket OS Mainline on Freenode and Matrix, where a bunch of amazing developers mainline their devices and joke around where they, where they, when they don't. So, to sum it up, observe, improvise, adapt, overcome. Here you can see a few examples. On the left, you can see how tiny the wires have to be, as tiny as one tenth on a mil of a millimeter sometimes to get a serial console. And Angela is showing his way of uh, connecting QR to his phone. He basically solder soldered a connector so that he can easily switch devices. And on the right, on the light, you can see a frame buffer console. So basically, logs are directly on the phone screen.
and sometimes nothing seems to work and you have to get creative. And so had to Angelo. He went as far as connecting a oscilloscope to his device to find correct pins. So now would be the time for you guys to ask any questions you may wish. So, okay, any questions? Anyone? Well, we were so good that nobody <laughs> has questions. <laughs> well, do, do we have plans have for... for more platform? Yes, uh, we do. Uh, I have um, sort of abandoned the um, lawyer platform uh, last year, um, but uh, the, the code that I wrote for it um, is not lost. Uh, it's legit, and um, we are planning to bring it back and uh, mainline it um so it it will come uh we don't really know in this moment in which order uh things will come uh but we plan to um upstream uh a956 and 976 and 998 and 845 also uh devices that we have uh, let me add something to your answer angelo for those yeah. those uninformed uh, lawyer series is Xperia X, Xperia X Compact, and Xperia Touch, the projector. Yes, yes, exactly. So there is one more and very usual question for all these, you know, efforts. So can you make a phone call? Well, uh, currently, yes and no. Um, in this moment, we have some issues on the modem, uh, on the SDM630 platform. Um, that's um, actually rebooting every now and then. So while it is sort of possible, it's not stable yet, but it'll come shortly, I believe, okay. yeah. and Thanks. I hope. But, you know, you can ping localhost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. Okay. indeed. Okay, so any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't be shy. Even though we were so good that we have left no doubts. <laughs> perhaps... yeah, no doubt. It was perfect, guys. So I really enjoyed this talk and you know, I have a lot of you know hope in your work. So, so Let us great. know if you want us to it a lot possibly well. upstream your phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question from Martin is what about GPS? Um, I think well, Angela can ask me that one. Yeah, GPS is a bit more complicated than uh, than that. Um, yeah. The GPS is, needs the modem to be up, and it needs the modem to be fully stable. Otherwise, it won't ever, ever try to even start looking for satellites. Uh, this is currently a um, topic that we haven't explored yet, but um, we are confident that we will get it working as well. Okay, so it looks like this was the last question we had, but we still have a chat. So if you want to chat, feel free to chat. It was great talk and a great achievement. What you did, it's, it's amazing. So I'm really <laughs> impressed. You. And uh, thank you for you know joining our conference. And uh, everyone, if you want to vote for this or you know give feedback for this presentation, go to the program, the schedule, and just vote. Thanks, everyone, and uh, see you next time with you know another achievement. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting us, and thank yeah. you for listening. Definitely. Oh, there is one more question. Uh, will Loti be included? Well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Linux supports it. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it doesn't, then we will make sure it will. Somehow. Well, at least we will try. <laughs> yeah, that's the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I would 
add probably that um, many people have noted that we cannot run um, full version of GNOME on our phones, we can. which which I would say is not true. This is Arch Linux running full version of GNOME. Nice. <laughs> I'm the KDE guy, so uh, that's still nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can well, also run desktop plasma, but yeah. that's not really usable because it's not. It's not really for touch screens. screens. Yeah, yeah, okay. but you can run it. Yeah, but plasma mobile is coming along. Yeah. Okay, so thank you guys, and I will be very happy now to see you next year again, maybe even live. <laughs> Let's hope. Hopefully. That. Hopefully, and okay, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.